Hey guys, it's Chris at Highline Guitars. You're watching another one of my YouTube guitar building videos. If you're new to the channel, welcome. I hope that by the end of this video, you might consider subscribing. What I'm going to be talking about today is part 15 of my neck through guitar belt. All the parts are here. I just recently took delivery of the hip shot bridge that I'm going to use and the hip shot locking tuners that I'm going to use. So I'm ready to do what I call the pre-assembly. And what that is, it's basically a process where I will assemble the entire guitar. I will install all the parts except for the nut and the strings. That's actually going to come later. But by doing pre-assembly, I can drill all the holes, mount everything up and make sure that everything is positioned correctly and that everything fits before I apply the finish. If I were to wait and do the assembly after applying the finish, there's always the chance that I'm going to drop a screwdriver onto the guitar or a drill bit or I'm going to slip with a tool, you know, something like that and it's going to cause damage to the finish. If I damage it now, before applying the finish, I can fix it relatively easily, depending on the severity of the damage, of course, but I don't have to worry about repairing the finish that I've applied. And that can be a real uh, chore to do. And that's especially true if you're painting a guitar and then applying clear coat finishes. If you do all that work and then start to do your assembly, you know, drilling the holes to mount the bridge, drilling the holes to mount the pickups and all that, the, the jack, the strap buttons, any damage that happens can be very difficult to repair. And sometimes the damage isn't that visible. You'll have a nice glossy finish on your guitar, but then after you've done all the assembly, you'll look at it and you'll start to see all these scratches all over the surface and you'll wonder, well, how did that happen? It happened because of the rough handling that typically occurs as you're trying to drill holes and mount components. So I'm going to do a pre-assembly first, and then I'll take everything off, apply the finish. Then I'll do the final assembly, which will happen much faster and is much more gentle on the finish. However, before I can do the pre-assembly, I need to make the pickups. Because as you know, I like to wind my own pickups. And as I explained in previous videos, I purchased the components to make the pickups. And this guitar is going to feature, obviously, two humbuckers. One in the bridge and one in the neck position. And I have all the components to make those right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my CNC winder to wind those pickups. Now, folks have asked me, why make your own pickups when you can buy pickups off the shelf and you don't have to go through all that, that trouble? Well, it's part of the hobby for me. I mean, why make a guitar when I can buy one at Guitar Center or Sweetwater or Reverb or wherever? It's part of the hobby. It's what I like to do. And in fact, even making the winders is part of the hobby for me. This is... Uh, I think it's the sixth or seventh winder I've owned in the past 20, 25 years. And this one is, like I said, a CNC winder. It's controlled by my computer. In fact, if you are interested in making a similar winder, you can purchase plans for this winder from my eGuitar Plans website or from my YouTube merchandise store, which is available uh, below the description for this video. And with this winder, I can quickly and easily wind a wide variety of different types of pickups. But what's really cool is I have the ability to control the tone that I'm going to be making for this guitar. When I first started building guitars a couple of decades ago, one of the first guitars I made was an acoustic guitar. And I made several acoustic instruments over the years. And what I thought about when I was making that acoustic guitar is that the luthiers who specialize in making acoustics 
have total control over the tone of the instrument they're making based on the wood they choose and how they carve it, thickness it, and assemble it. Total control. The electric guitar builder, however, really doesn't because what we do is, or what is typically done, is you make the guitar and then you purchase off-the-shelf pickups and install them and hope for the best. Now you've got you know, a somewhat of an idea of how the pickup is going to sound if the manufacturer provides sound samples that are trustworthy. But really you don't know what it's going to sound like until you install them and play the guitar. And if you don't like it, you can always swap out to a different pickup, but you end up in this never-ending uh, tone chase where you're constantly trying to find the right combination of pickups and you know perhaps amplifier and, and all that kind of stuff, electronics in your guitar to get the tone you want. But if you wind your own pickups, you can dial in that tone. You can, especially as time goes by and you develop experience, you, you start to understand what you need to do to make the pickup sound the way you want it to. And that's kind of what uh, the, the, the phase I'm in right now is I have to decide what kind of pickups, what style of pickups I'm going to make for this guitar. Now, in my opinion, this guitar is, I wouldn't call it, definitely wouldn't call it a heavy metal guitar. It's not pointy enough. And yes, there are some, some flatter angles to it, but uh, you know, I, you could certainly play it heavy metal with the right pickups in here. But you know, I'm not sure that that's the type of, of or the style of pickup that I wanna wind for this guitar. So what I'll probably shoot for is something a little a little tamer uh, and when I say tamer it's gonna have a little bit lower output but that's gonna allow me to uh, wind a pickup that's gonna have a broader range of tone it's gonna have more balanced uh, bass mid-range and treble and when I wind a pickup I can make those decisions about the style I want and that's gonna drive the decision about the components, the type of wire I'm going to use, and the type of magnet. Now, when it comes to making pickups, you can get as complicated as you want to get. If you do some research on making your own pickups on the internet, you're going to find it's a rabbit hole that is so deep you'll never see the bottom of it. And people get really crazy in that rabbit hole. There's some very strong passions there. Personally, I like to keep it pretty simple. Viewers who know that I make pickups will often ask questions either in the comments section of a video or they'll send me an email regarding pickup design that are sometimes so arcane I just I can't answer them. Uh, I backed out of that rabbit hole years ago and decided I'm just going to keep this as simple as possible because if it gets too complicated, I'm going to lose interest in it. And really, I just follow some basic rules of thumb when it comes to designing the pickups. First of all, I use three different gauges of wire uh, depending on how I want to design the pickup. I've got 42, 43, and 44 gauge wire. I usually buy these one pound spools for my 42 and my 44 gauge. For the 43 gauge, I've got a big five pound spool and that's because I use 43 gauge a lot. Now, the higher the number, the thinner the wire. Now, here's where the rules of thumb come into play. The thinner the wire, the more turns you can put on your bobbins. The more turns you can put on the bobbin, the higher the output, the louder the pickup is gonna sound. At the same time, the more output the pickup has usually means there's going to be less treble frequencies in the outgoing signal. So the pickup starts to sound warmer as it gets louder. Now, when you design a pickup based on the kind of wire that you're gonna use and the, the strength of the output signal and whether or not there's going to be issues with the treble signal, that's when you start to look at the type of magnet that you're going to install in the pickup. And the magnet can um, preserve 
and even enhance your treble frequencies depending on the type of magnet you use. For example, if I was going to wind a lower power, more of a PAF style humbucker, I would obviously use a thicker wire with fewer number of turns. And what I would wind up with, even before I finish making the pickup, I know that it's going to have a broader range of tone. It's going to have good bass, mid-range, and treble frequencies. So to complement that, I would choose either an Alnico 2 or an Alnico 5 magnet because those magnets really help to um, preserve that broad range of frequencies. If, on the other hand, I was going to wind the exact opposite, a high-powered pickup. I would use 44 gauge wire and I'd put as many turns as I could fit onto the bobbin, knowing that once the pickup was made, I'm going to lose some of those treble frequencies because that's just the nature of how uh, the electronics of the pickup work when you wind up a coil that big. So what I would do is I would opt for either an Alnico 8 or a ceramic magnet because those magnets, they're very, very strong, will help to preserve some of those treble frequencies. Now, there's no uh, hard and fast rules here, so you can mix and match. You know, you could put a ceramic magnet into a lower wind pickup and make it sound super, super bright. There's just all different kinds of choices that you can make. And that's one of the reasons why I like to make pickups, because I can make those decisions and really affect the way the guitar is going to sound. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to wind up these pickups. And I'm going to let you kind of watch as I do this work. But I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I've done videos on that in the past. And in fact, there's other guys who've done videos on making single coils, P90s, humbuckers, you name it. There are videos out there that show that process. And it gets kind of boring after a while because you're just watching a coil get wound and then you're hearing a guy talk about how he solders the leads to the, to the uh, ends of the, of the coil and, and how he bolts it all together. So there's not a lot of, of detail there that's of interest. So I'm just gonna let you watch along and then when I come back, I'll show you the finished pickups.
Okay, so what did I end up with in terms of specs? Well, on the bridge pickup, I wound 5,750 turns, uh, 43 gauge, solderable poly nylon insulated wire. Uh, that's the wire that I prefer to use. I know that I can use plain enamel or heavy forum var, but in the way I do things, I don't see the point. Uh, if I was making vintage replica style pickups, that's probably what I would do, but I don't do that. And part of the reason for that is because even though you can get wire with the same type of insulation that was used back in the 50s and 60s, the wire that's on the inside of that insulation is nothing like the wire that was made in those days. Wire made today uses much more pure copper and completely different manufacturing techniques. So they're not even close to being the same. And I wanna make pickups that are Highline guitar pickups. I don't care about making a Gibson PAF or a, you know, a vintage Fender Telecaster style pickup. So I'm perfectly happy with using the solderable poly nylon insulated wire. It's inexpensive, it is easy to use, it's reliable and consistent. So that's what I use. And like I said, I use 5,750 on the bridge, and then on the neck I use 4,750 turns. And the reason for that is because, you know, there's a difference there of about a thousand turns. Uh, and that's because when you switch from um, the bridge pickup to the neck pickup on a guitar that has two pickups, the neck is always going to sound louder if the two pickups were wound with exactly the same number of turns. 
So to balance out the volume, I dial back the number of turns on the neck pickup to match that of the bridge pickup in terms of volume. So when you're switching from the bridge to the neck, you don't get that sudden uh, jump in volume. And also, I use uh, a couple of different measurements to gauge the pickup's performance. The first is the most common that everybody uh, refers to, and that's DC resistance. Now, there are a lot of folks out there who will say DC resistance is worthless, it, it has no meaning, it doesn't accomplish anything, and so on and so forth. That's true to a certain extent. You cannot judge a pickup's tone by the DC resistance that it measures. It's not reliable enough. But what you can do is you can use DC resistance to determine how loud the pickup is going to be when it uh, plays through the amplifier. And the higher the number, usually the louder the pickup gets. So that kind of tells you how clean or dirty the pickup is going to sound before you even play the guitar. So uh, the bridge pickup in this case has 11,120 ohms of DC resistance. The neck pickup is a little bit less at 9,220 ohms. In terms of output, that puts those, these two pickups sort of in the middle between a vintage style PAF sounding pickup and a high wind, high output, heavy metal guitar pickup. So this is sort of in between that. Now the number that I use that does matter is inductance. And the bridge pickup measures 5.19 Henry's of inductance and the neck pickup measures 3.88 Henry's of inductance. Now basically what that means is, uh, to put it simply, the higher the uh, measurement of inductance in Henry's, the warmer and darker the pickup will sound. Pickups typically will measure anywhere from 1.5 Henry's all the way up to about 6 Henry's. When you start to get into the uh, 5 to 6 Henry's, you run the risk of the pickup sounding so warm that it begins to sound muddy. It loses so much of the treble frequencies in the tone. So you can look at that number and kind of get an idea of what kind of tone you're going to get from the pickups. And since the bridge is at 5.19 Henry's, it's going to be pretty warm. Typically, uh, humbucker pickups are usually between 3.5 and 4.5 Henry. So this is a little bit higher. The uh, neck pickup is at 3.88. So it slots in kind of right in the middle of where a typical humbucker is going to uh, measure at. And when it comes to measuring inductance, you can't really do it until the pickup has been fully assembled. And that's because the magnet will have an effect on the level of inductance. So that's where things get kind of um, interesting in terms of what magnet should you choose. And I choose magnets based on experience that I've had making pickups. And I know that when I use a 43 gauge wire and put anywhere from uh, 4,000 to 6,000 turns of wire on a bobbin, I can probably get away with using an Alnico 5 magnet. Typically, I'll use Alnico 5 if I'm pretty confident that the DC resistance is going to measure somewhere between 8,000 ohms and 12,000 ohms. That's good uh, space for the Alnico 5. When you're below 8,000, you can select between Alnico 2, 3, or 4. Those magnets will work pretty well. Each one will offer slightly different tone, so you got to kind of experiment to see which one is giving you the tone that you like. Now, if the pickup I wind is over 12,000 ohms, then I have to start looking at either Alnico 8 or Ceramic 8. And that's because over 12,000 ohms of DC resistance, there's a good chance I'm going to lose a lot of treble frequencies. And those stronger magnets will help preserve those treble frequencies in the outgoing signal. So that prevents the high-powered pickup from sounding too muddy. 
Now with this pickup, this one here, the bridge pickup, it's measuring, like I said, 11,120 ohms of DC resistance, which isn't terribly high. I mean, it's, it's warmer than you would find a, like a vintage PAF humbucker, but it's only measuring at 5.19 Henry's of inductance. And that level of inductance could make the pickup sound too warm with an Alnico 5 magnet. I don't know for sure. I'm not going to know for sure until I've installed the pickups and played the guitar. If the bridge pickup sounds too warm, which it probably won't because as you know, a bridge pickups typically sound brighter because of their position. So even at 5.19 Henry's of inductance, I may be okay. But if I decide, oh, that's too warm, I, I need to, to brighten this up a bit, I can pop that magnet out and replace it with probably an Alnico 8, because an Alnico 8 will boost the treble signal just like a ceramic magnet will, but not uh, with as much harshness as the ceramic magnet does. So <laughs> judging magnets is kind of like going to a wine tasting. You have all these different wines, all different characters and flavors, and you got to try it to know what it's going to taste like. And it's the same thing with magnets. I could give you very specific um, explanation as to what different magnets sound like, but in your ears it may be different. So um, think of your ears as your, your taste buds, uh, uh, the way your taste buds react to wine. So uh, everyone's is going to be a little bit different. And you have to test them and try them out to get an idea. Fortunately, magnets aren't terribly expensive. So you can buy a whole wide range of magnets. I've got a whole bunch of them. I got a bunch of ceramics on this side of my toolbox, and then I'll, I'll go two, three, four, and five, and eight on this side. So, you know, I just grab what I want and try it out to see how it's gonna sound because I can always swap them out in humbucker pickups. It's not necessarily the case with, uh, you know, <clears throat> Strat style or Tele style single coils, but uh, definitely with humbuckers and P90s. So, at any rate, um, that's the status with the pickups for the neck through guitar build. Uh, what I plan to do in the next episode is do that preliminary assembly. Then I'm going to remove everything, do the final sanding, and start to apply the finish, which, by the way, I haven't fully decided on. I've got a couple of ideas. We'll, uh, we'll figure that out. So um, as always, uh, please give the video a thumbs up if you found this information to be interesting. If you got any comments or questions, post them down below. Either I or someone in the community will uh, endeavor to try and answer them for you. Uh, if you're new to the channel, welcome. I hope that you'll consider subscribing. And until the next episode, take care, stay safe, and I hope you'll be back to watch part 16.